Thank you, Val. This wonderful first day of winter, we have some announcements uh, to be had here. First of all, Wednesday, of course, 6 o'clock is prayer meeting, and then that'll be followed by a trustees meeting at 7 o'clock. And there are flyers on the literature table. Uh, if you have someone that you'd like to suggest for the West Portland Baptist Church uh, officers uh, to help out the nominating committee, and they need to be filled out and returned to Pastor Charlie or placed on the little church on the table in the back. And along with that, the nominating committee needs to meet uh, either uh, following church next Sunday or the Sunday after, the 14th or the 21st. Uh, <clears throat> so please see Pastor Charlie if you have a preference on which day works the best if you're on the nominating committee. And the winter lunch and morning service will be Sunday, January 28th, and the host for lunch is Amy and David Farnham. Amy Belcher, of course. <laughs> Always have to correct that. Okay, and if anyone is interested in leading the Pinewood Derby, we're still looking for someone to, to take, uh, learn how to take that over. Uh, Earl's been doing a great job for many years. Have a few other announcements here. Dear West Portland Baptist Church family, Thank you so much for the cards, gifts, and words of encouragement you gave to our family during the Christmas season. We appreciate your kindness and love. We praise the Lord for your goodness to us and for being a blessing to us. In Christ's love, Pastor Charlie and Nancy. And then we have a, a wanted poster here. Uh, looks like this. They're out on the bulletin board out in the breezeway. Uh, and it's for something coming up, uh, a kind of fun time, I guess. People would like to be involved in it. Uh, it says, you're cordially invited to attend a murder mystery party hosted by Linda, Steve and Linda Kiefer. And you'll be assigned to play a role. So depending on how many people sign up, uh, the roles will be determined what they're going to be. It's going to take place Saturday, February 17th at 5 o'clock. Uh, and the activity center, and dinner will be provided. So if you want to be involved in a mystery and have a dinner, uh, please see Steve or Linda. Uh, sign up for that. And their numbers, uh, if you'd like to call them, are going to be on the poster. And there's also a website that uh, you can go to. Thank you. <coughs> All righty. Thank you, Gary. We will uh, pray together. We have several needs. Thank the Lord. George Burnett did well with his open heart surgery on Friday. And keep praying for him in, in a long recovery from that. He's in Pittsburgh. And also be reminded of Sue having a procedure yesterday on her foot. She's doing well. So pray for Sue Sorter. Uh, Becca, I believe, is going to have to be headed back to college here sooner than later. So uh, say goodbye to Becca as she heads off to her last semester. Ooh, that means there must be a graduation coming up like in May or something. Hope, hopefully. <laughs> Possibly, hopefully, maybe. So uh, we'll see. <laughs> we'll probably see her at spring break or Easter or somewhere before then to see how that's going. You know, if, if, she's, if she's like this, you'll know it might not be going so well. But I have a good semester for Becca, and we'll be praying for you. And certainly... Uh, some folks are sick right now. We got the flus, viruses, bugs around. So many folks dealing with those things. Pray for them uh, that they will quickly be recovered and feel better. So uh, let's look to the Lord and let's pray together for the needs we have. Father, we come to you this day and we are reminded of answered prayer is a blessing. We thank you that we look back upon our lives and we look back upon even the past week or past couple weeks and seen things that you did for us that we praise you for because they were answers to specific or particular requests that we made. And we thank you for those. Uh, we certainly thank you for what you've done for the lives of you and many of the folks on this list. Uh, some who have made it through uh, difficult procedures. We think of George Burnett and uh, a very difficult surgery, but he did well and uh, the recovery is underway. We thank you for that. Praying that you will continue to lift him up and raise him up and be with Carolyn and their entire family. 
Pray for Sue as she recovers from a procedure. We pray that you'd be with many of the other folks who are listed here who are dealing with physical difficulties and situations. We just pray for your hand of healing and help to be upon each one. We ask that you would provide for the many needs that our bodies give us. The failing and, and weakness of the earthly body is certainly seen and not to be denied. And yet we need your help with, with its situation, with its frailty. And we pray for that. We pray that you'll not just help the, the body that we reside in, but as we look at this list of many people from short-term needs to longer-term needs, we pray that you'll also encourage their hearts and meet their spiritual needs and provide for them, not just in physical ways, but also in emotional and spiritual ways. And we just pray that your hand will be upon each one and each family that goes through the, the physical affliction with their loved ones. We'd ask today that you'd be with and provide for other needs that we might have, needs for guidance and wisdom, needs for direction, needs for your hand to be upon us, perhaps strengthening us, uh, perhaps ministering to us, perhaps we have burdens for other family members that haven't been listed here but that are on our hearts today. Perhaps we have burdens for people we know from our workplaces, maybe even our neighbors. Maybe we don't have the liberty to share their name and put it on a list. But it's a great burden to us, and we pray for those who might have those kind of unspoken needs and unspoken burdens. We pray that you'd be with the needs of our country, which are many. We pray for those who lead our country, that they might have godly wisdom, that they might seek you for the wisdom that they need. Uh, we fear in many cases they never seek you for wisdom in some, in some of the decisions they make. And yet we would pray that they might, and we would pray that you might lead and direct. We pray that you would be with our military men and women, keep them in your care and safety. Pray also for our missionaries to, to minister to them. We'd ask, dear God, as well, that you would provide for uh, all of the needs we have uh, in any way, and the needs for safety on roads that are less than than, than good many days, the needs for help and strength, the needs for healing from routine sickness, all the things that we need, we trust you with and trust you for. We ask now that even as we have a few moments to individually bring our requests before you as privately and as individuals, we pray that you administer these things in the same way you answer the things we prayed together for as we bring them all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. This morning our scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with, <clears throat> with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this per perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, 
in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Thank you, and may the Lord richly bless this reading of his heart to our, her, of his word to our heart. Sorry. We'll have our kids come up for our children's chat this morning. I have my box back. I got a box here. Remember this box last month I brought this box? No, you don't remember it? Well, I brought my box last month. And what was in it last month? No, it wasn't cookies. What? Starburst. I asked, is there something good or bad in my box? And nobody knew. And so we had to have you guess whether it was good or bad. And finally, those of you who were here guessed and took guesses. And when I opened it, it was something good. Starburst. Who doesn't like candy, right? So the question is today, is there something good or bad in my box today? Good. 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 It's going to be mints. Okay. And we're sure it's mints. Any, any thoughts? There's nothing? Oh, there, no, there's something in here. Is it good or bad is the question. It's something. It's stuff. <laughs> so, uh, once again, we don't know what's in the box until I open it, correct? That's, that's just truthful. So, we're going to have to have a vote. Who says it's good stuff? Uh, three of you. Who says it's bad stuff? <laughs> one of you, and we have one who's, a couple who aren't voting. Well, let me tell you, it's stuff, all right. Oh, look, it's bills. <laughs> well, what else would be in here after Christmas, right? Um, uh, Department of Taxation and Finance. Any of you know those folks? Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness. Spectrum. Anybody have one of those? A Spectrum bill. Oh, yes. Oh, look, Ollie's Outlet Barn. Yes, a bill from Ollie's. Oh my, Burger King, Home Depot, Walmart. Who wants to share my bills? Well, we have one hand. <laughs> it's, you'll give it to your father. <laughs> well, that's so thoughtful of you. <laughs> Nobody wants to share my bills. It's not like the Starburst, huh? Everybody wanted a Starburst. Nobody wants a bill. Um, well, well, we'll cover these up because nobody wants my bills. And I'll read a verse about bills. The Bible says we all have bills that we have to pay. We all have things that we have to live. Does food cost money? Yes. How many of you like to eat? Anybody like to eat? It costs money to eat. Uh, you know, there's a few Bills fans around, and you've got to have a TV to watch the Bills game. Do they, do they like TV at least tonight if they're a Bills fan? Yes, they do. Uh, so they to watch the game. So we, we have to have money, and we get bills because we have, need money. But there's something else we owe that I couldn't put in the box. We owe something that you can't put in a box. Uh, the Lord talks about the stuff you can put in a box first. He says in Romans 13, Render therefore to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, honor to whom honor is due. And then it says this, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. There's a debt we owe, and that's a debt to love people. And we owe people a debt of love. In other words, just like these have to be paid, Becca has a college bill in her box back at home. Uh, just and none of the rest of you may be having one of those, but whatever you owe is owed to them, you're supposed to pay it. But not in the box, something we owe as Christians to everybody around us is we owe them our love. It's like a debt. 
we're to pay the debt of love to people around us. So all of you, you don't have to share my bills. But you have your own debt to love your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, your neighbors, your family, your parents, other people around you. You owe the debt of love to everyone around you. And it's harder to pay sometimes than these bills. Uh, I write a check, or these days you just transfer the money around and the bill's paid. Love just is a debt hard to pay. You know, and so remember, you may not have any of these, but you have a debt, and that's the debt of love you owe to all those people around you. Make sure you pay that debt to them and love others. You can head back from the children's chat. I'm not surprised nobody wanted my bills. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because I'm not sure how uh, they're going to pay my bills. <laughs> Except they give it to their father, of course. <laughs> Don't you love a sharing child, David? Don't you love a sharing child? Last week, we started looking in the book of Acts at the power of God. And we looked at the first few verses uh, at the beginning of chapter 2, the, the day of Pentecost, the founding of the church, Today we're going to come toward the end of chapter 2. This study is not going to be verse by verse and hitting every section. But we see the power of God, something that we need in our lives, is exhibited over and over and over again in the book of Acts. Several years ago, an elementary school in Indiana had a special grandparents' day at the school. Westfield does that, do they not, Val? Yep every spring. Brockton might, but Westfield does. They send us the flyer to throw on our bulletin board. And this school in Indiana had a Grandparents' Day for all the kids to have their grandparents come. They had a special assembly, a special lunch, and a program. And then afterward, in each classroom, each classroom set up an area for photos with their students and the grandparents. In one classroom, they set the grandparents and the students uh, together to take pictures each family at a time, in front of this beautifully graphical display of the world. You know, made just a picturesque backdrop, the world in, in displayed behind them as they, they sat in front of them and everybody took pictures. It wasn't until after the picture taking had occurred in that classroom and people started looking at the pictures that they realized that above the, the world on that banner that was behind as a backdrop for the picture taking was a phrase above everybody's head behind it, which most people got the phrase in their pictures, a few didn't. It said, discover the ancient world on Grandparents' Day. Now, it used to be I thought that funny. Now that I'm a grandparent, I'm quite offended by that. Uh, discover the ancient world. Um, well, I'm not sure that was the intent of Grandparents' Day, but that was in one classroom, the picture, discover the ancient world. Well, let's go back to the book of Acts because we are discovering the ancient world of Acts. And quite frankly, it was a different world than our world. It was a different world back then, but as God founded the church 2,000 years ago almost, from that very different world, we see this, that God's power is still much the same. And this morning we see that God's power is to reach those who do not believe. People who did not believe in this passage are very different than people here. Number one, the people in Acts chapter 2 are almost entirely and completely Jewish, which makes them different than us in, in heritage, in background, in genetics, because they are a race of folks, a nation. It's almost all Jewish folks who is being reached in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches this message. They were listening to the message because last week we looked at the fact that the languages that people heard coming from the mouth of the disciples, multiple languages, got their attention. And as this message continued, and you can read the message this afternoon if you'd like, if you have a few minutes, but it comes down to the end of the message where in verse 36, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. In other words, it was an indictment that these people, not long before this, 40 days, these people were standing, screaming, yelling, 
this cute little phrase, crucify him. That's the Easter message, isn't it? But that's what these people were all saying for the most part. The ones who were in town back on that feast, now in town on the day of Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, the same folks who were in both, and some weren't here for the first, but are here now for the second feast, the ones who were here for both were saying what? Crucify him, crucify him. And when Jesus was crucified, they were happy. They were excited. They thought it was a great thing. Forty days later, things had simmered down. There was still this talk once in a while, a little bit about Jesus and these disciples of him, nuts that they were, who thought he was resurrected. But it was all slowly calming down. And then the day of Pentecost comes. Peter stands up and declares the nation of Israel guilty of the crucifixion of their Lord and their Messiah. And so what happens when you're convicted by words of the deed of murder of your own Messiah, what happens? Verse 37, many of those who heard this, it says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. The phrase cut to the heart is the idea of conviction. It was the idea of being smited or stunned in their heart. It's the idea of words that sting and words that hurt and words that inflict. And in the infliction of these words were the infliction of guilt. We are guilty. We did this. For those who yelled, crucify him, there was no denial. I said that. I meant that. I did that. Imagine now if you're convinced that this truly was the Son of God. And what was your role in the end of the earthly existence of the Son of God? You said, crucify him. How do you ever get right with God when you wanted his own son crucified? It almost seems hopeless, doesn't it? You know, a lot of times people say, I can't believe in Jesus. He could never forgive that I have done this or that. Well, is there anything much worse in the this or that's that God would have to forgive than killing his own son? I mean, that's just, you know, what worse is there than killing Jesus and, and saying, crucify him, crucify him, and celebrating over his death and mocking and ridiculing him as he, car as he tried to carry his cross and had to have that other guy carry it for him because he couldn't bear it himself. And you still mocked him, you laughed at him, you scorned him, and now you're standing here and saying, what chance do I have of God forgiving me? And so that's what it conveys in these verses, you know, that... They asked this question after they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What hope do we have? Is there a chance of any hope at all for us now that we realize we have endorsed the killing of the Messiah, Savior, Lord Jesus? And Peter then has a lesson of hope and a lesson of God's power. First, God's power brought this conviction. This conviction in their heart that they actually had done this is first astonishing. Any of you like to be told you're wrong? You know, yeah, you're wrong. You did it. You're wrong. And then worse, we actually did it. <laughs> and we have to say, yeah, I did it. We don't like that. And I don't know that they liked it but they accepted the reality of it. And it caused them to be downcast to the question, what shall we do? How could we ever get right with God now that we understand that we killed his own son? And God's power came upon them to convict them of their sin, to have remorse and sorrow and have this ill feeling within them like we are doomed for what we've done. And in truth, what worse could you do against the God of heaven than to kill his son? But Peter then said, there's hope. And the message of these verses isn't you're convicted, you're hopeless, you're never going to heaven, you're never going to see God, eternity in hell for you, there's no chance anymore. That's not Peter's message. Peter said to them, repent, turn in the opposite direction, and in their hearts, they're already doing that. He talks about being baptized, and we'll get to that in a moment, for the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin, and receive the gift of the Spirit. 
What he's saying is, you have an opportunity to have this undone. Whatever sin you've committed against God, as bad as it might seem, as horrible as you might think God senses or sees it as, we've not, any of us, killed the Son of God. We couldn't have done this. Why? He's gone long before we got here. This is not a sin we could commit. So let me first say that any sin you're convicted of in unbelief before you come to Christ, no matter how bad you might think it was, if God could forgive this, he can forgive you. Whatever you did. Looking around today, probably there's very few of us who are unbelievers who are coming to understand for the first time that we're sinners and that we need forgiveness of Christ. Maybe somebody watching today or somebody who watches this months from now might be watching this and saying, that's me, and I certainly didn't do something as bad as killing Jesus Christ, but I've done some really bad things. What hope is there for me? What should I do? And if that's the question, what you shall do under the conviction of the Spirit is also understand the Spirit brings you to the solution of the problem. It says in verse 39, For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And he exhorted them in verse 40 and testified, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation and those who gladly received his word. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died and paid the price for you. The price for killing the Son of God. The price for whatever you might have done. Anything you could have ever done against God or against anybody else is not so much that you cannot be forgiven. Forgiveness can be spread broadly. It can be spread uniquely to your situation. Forgiveness can come to those who did say crucify him. And forgiveness can be coming to those of us who did something far lesser, but something still sinful. For that is what God does. He, by power, draws us not to be downcast and to just say, I'm done. But he then gives the message of hope, the message of salvation, the power of salvation for Jesus to forgive. I think you have to be astonished, perhaps, in a sense, that on that day, as a uh, we, were, we read it earlier, the scripture passage in verse 41. How many people were brought to this place of belief at one time? 3,000. That's a lot of folks, isn't it? 3,000 people. Now, we don't know what the crowd size is that, that Peter was preaching to, but 3,000 of them are a lot of them. And 3,000 of them at the same time asked this question, what shall we do? Are we without hope? Do we have no chance at heaven or salvation? We've endorsed the killing of the Savior. What hope is there for us? And 3,000 of them found hope in the power of the salvation of God. God does things we can't do. And remember, that's what we said God's power is. It's doing something you can't do. You can't even save yourself. And if you can't save yourself... How many of you can save 3,000 others with you? Not good chances, are they? We can't even bring ourselves to the level of salvation. We need Jesus. We need what he did on the cross to forgive us. We need faith to trust in him and believe upon him. We need his work that he did to be applied to our account on our behalf. You know, I hold it, held my little box up with my bills. Uh, if one of, the, one of our kids was uniquely rich, and that wasn't the case, and they said, oh, I'll pay all your bills. Wouldn't that be nice if somebody did that to you? Uh, whatever bills you have. Maybe you owe taxes. Maybe you owe a college somewhere. Maybe you owe something that's a, a repair of a car. Whatever it is, you owe something. And wouldn't it be just fantastic if somebody comes along and says, I'll pay your bill for you. You know, most of us are, are, are willing to entertain that thought. Maybe God comes along and God miraculously somehow says, I'll pay your bill for you. I've had God do that. Uh, I, I may not have known where it came from, may not have known how it happened, but God paid a bill or two on my behalf. And we're happy about that. But the greatest bill you owe, the debt of sin, for the wages, the earnings of sin, Romans says, is death. 
the greatest bill you owe, God's power paid it. So that you don't have to pay it. The wages of sin for the Christian are not death. Not yours. It's the death of Jesus. And he paid your death that you deserve as he died on a cross. Allowing the power of God to remove sin from your account. No, it might not have been the sin of yelling crucify him back in, Acts, in the end of the Gospels going into Acts chapter 2. But whatever you've done, however many times you've done it, whoever you hurt, whatever hurt you had against God, no matter what it was, God's power comes and washes sin away. And that's what happened on that day. The power of God did something that we can't do. And that is forgive ourselves, earn a salvation, deserve a salvation, work for salvation, obtain forgiveness on our own. None of it is humanly possible. We cannot humanly find a way to wash over and forgive our sin and say, God, I've washed up, I've cleaned up, look at me, I'm saved now. No human can make that claim. None of us in this room, no human that's lived, no human, the best of the best, could ever make the claim, God, I've done it. I have done what very few could do. I've washed away my own sin. Because they haven't. Because the wages of sin is always death. And there's usually no death involved when somebody starts touting all the things they've done to wash away their sin. Nobody ever says, I died. I, I died to wash away my sin. That doesn't usually happen because that doesn't make it, doesn't cut, cut it. We don't want to die to forgive our sin, and it doesn't do it anyway. He died. He did something we could not do in his power to forgive our sin. And at this point in time, 3,000 people formed what was the initial church. Now, I understand that they didn't all live in Jerusalem, and they didn't all stay there. Um, we looked at the passage last week at the beginning of the chapter, and we have all these people hearing the, the gospel and the word of the Lord being preached to them by Peter in their own language. And that means they didn't come from Jerusalem. They weren't speaking Hebrew. But they were Jewish people, or people who were fearers of God, though not Jewish, who were in, in the city of Jerusalem to worship at the day Feast of Pentecost, and God touched them, and they went back home. But those who stayed in Jerusalem knew this was a, a, a dramatic decision. This is a big decision. The multitude of people who were in Israel, and in Jerusalem in particular, Jewish leaders included, are not really excited about 3,000 people standing up and believing in Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, they're something less than excited. They're downright, in chapter 3, miserably unhappy about this. And guess what? If you were a Jewish person who's decided that you needed the forgiveness and the power of God in your life through resurrected Jesus, you are about, and they think they all knew it, you are about to pay a price. Some have the question, why in the book of Acts is it that as soon as they believed, we dumped them in water and baptized them? Why is that? isn't necessarily the trend of the church for the 2,000 years since, but it is the trend of the church there. Why? Because they were taking a stand. And they were making a stand that I no longer accept what the Jewish leadership is teaching about Jesus. The Jewish leadership taught he was from Satan. The Jewish leadership taught that he was rightfully crucified. They taught we did the correct thing. We got rid of the enemy of God named Jesus so that we can go back to our own perverse ways of earning all kinds of money off the people and ripping them off and having religion for a profit like we did before he got here. They didn't quite say that, but that's what they were doing. And those who said, no, no, I believe he did rise from the dead. I believe I do need my faith in Jesus. I believe that he does by his power something we can't do, forgive our sins. They were baptized. They took that stand. They publicly, and baptism is a public profession of faith, they publicly stood up and says, I stand with Jesus Christ. And I will be baptized to do so. 3,000 of them. It's a long line of baptisms. 
took probably a significant amount of time. If you have you know, a few disciples baptizing one after the other, it's a long, long situation. And they did it knowing that some families would now disassociate from them, that they were the only one in their family that believed in Jesus. And what happened? The rest of the family kicked them out of the family. They knew that when they went to work the next morning, their boss said, there'll be no Jesus workers, followers here at this work. You're done. If they ran their own business, now many of them did. Remember, Joseph was a carpenter, and probably Jesus for a while as well. If they had a phone, they'd got a call the next morning, I'm finding somebody else to do the work. I'll have no Jesus follower doing my kitchen over. And that's how life went. It got hard. It got difficult. People put them aside. People put them out. People said, I will not associate with you. You're not in our family anymore. You are segregated out because you follow Jesus. There was a price that was paid by this decision. By the way, we're Americans and we hardly understand that. There are countries in this world today that if you trust Jesus, you are ostracized from your family. You are thrown out of your work. It is much the same as back then in some countries around this world today. That's just how it is some places. For all the faults and flaws we might think of America, that's one that we certainly don't have and we're thankful for that you can believe in Jesus and you might be ridiculed or laughed at or you know somehow made fun of perhaps or ostracized by some they just won't talk to you but it's not the same as in some places and it's not even close to the same as it was in Acts chapter 2 amongst the Jews so the founding of the church the gathering of these people and we see some of the things they started to do as this new church gathered in, in the end of chapter 2 and we'll not spend any time looking at those things but understand how do you get through when everything you do that you know is right humans are at every corner to say you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong you do it in the power of the Lord who forgave you God's power doesn't just forgive us he enables us to live a life like we're forgiven, to not go back, to not surrender to criticism, to not, because somebody says, renege on your faith in Jesus or you lose your job, you stand up and say, my job is lost. I will not. I will not go backward on my belief. I have believed in the power of God, and I stick with that. And these people stuck with that, and it cost them, and it hurt them, and yet they found that in their new community, the church, that in this community, they had others with them going through the same thing, and they had a kinship. And this is the surprising part. Jump to the last phrase of chapter 2. You would think, if you were just a Jewish person, you watched all this. You know, you're just watching. Well, look, 3,000 people believe a week later. And they've been tossed out of society. They've been, as we call it today, canceled. You know, we don't listen to them. We don't have them as our family. They're not welcome for our celebrations. They were thrown out of houses, thrown out of jobs. People would say, ooh, I'm not making that mistake. I'm not believing in Jesus. Look at what happens to you. And you'd think that the salvation experience would end. Wouldn't you think? Uh, look at the last verse. These people were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Other people said, I want Jesus so bad and the forgiveness he gives so bad and the power he gives so bad, I'll join them. Even if it means I lose my family, my job, my livelihood, I'll go on board with Jesus. Well, that makes no sense at all, does it? It doesn't make human sense at all. I will grant you that. It makes sense only in the power of God to reach our hearts. And God does reach down and touches our hearts. How many of you love the comics? I mean, it is the only part of the paper worth reading some days, isn't it? Any of you love baby blues? Oh, yes. Remember those days? Baby blues. Well... Baby Blues, the dad, that's the guy with that gigantic nose. You, you've seen him in the comics. His son's name is Hammy, and he says, Hammy, come out here, please. Now, as a parent, usually this is, you know, there's usually trouble when you're calling the kids come forward. Hammy, come out here, please. In the next panel, he says, son, 
I want to talk to you about tormenting your sisters. Uh oh. And he says, okay, as he climbs onto a chair. And then in the last panel, with a big smile on his face, he says, I'm always open to fresh ideas. Yes, brothers, so now don't do that at home. Uh, <laughs> I'm, that's all this little three panel cartoon goes to. But I'm pretty certain Dad's point of talking to his son about tormenting his sisters was not to give him some fresh ideas. You know, we live in a day and age where the church and Christians are looking for fresh ideas of our time when they ought to be looking back to Acts and simply the power of God. You know, I read, and I've read so many now in the years I've been a Christian and a pastor that I stopped reading them, the latest idea on how to reach the masses. You know, reach people, double your church, triple your church, reach everybody around you with this method. And, I, and it expresses some method, some, some way to do it. Mail them this, email them that, spam phone call them. Well, that'll work, won't it? We all love spam phone calls about Jesus. We love spam phone calls. We answer all of those, don't we? I've seen it all. We're looking for some fresh ideas on reaching people. How about the fact that God's power does it? And God's power takes the best gospel presentation you or I can give, or even part of it, and he does something with it in somebody else's life just because he's God and he can do that. He does things that you and I can't. I am utterly, completely, totally convinced there's nothing I can say from a pulpit that will ever win anybody to Jesus. Never. There's nothing I can say. And everything I can say won't cut it without the power of God working in somebody's life and it's not just because I said it. You could shuffle me out and bring Gary up on a uh, weekend in Florida, and it would be he, he's saying it. You could shuffle us both out and bring up another godly preacher who preaches from the Word, and it's that they say it. It's irrelevant who says it. It's that somebody says it. And the power of God, not our fresh ideas, the power of God wins people in the most unlikely places. Is it unlikely that after you watched your Jewish friends get ostracized, brought to poverty, and having almost nothing in favor of the humanity around them in the Jewish nation, because they took Jesus, that you'd want him too. No, you wouldn't want him too. And yet, daily, everybody wanted him too. How could that be? Because God's power worked in hearts. God can do something that we can't do. He saves people. He convicts them of their sin. He brings them to their spiritual knees. He brings them to the place that they're asking the question, what do I need to do? The gospel is presented, and they understand and realize the only thing I need to do is believe in Jesus. And yes, through some of those fresh ideas, I'm sure there's been gospel presentations that some have believed. But let's be honest, all we need is a gospel presentation and the power of God, and people can believe. That's all we need. That's all that's necessary. And here in Acts chapter 2, all that was necessary was a presentation of the truth and the power of God. Two things. The spirit of God's power and the right gospel presented. And what happens? God touches people's hearts. And that's important to understand. And when you think you failed, how many of you have shared Jesus with somebody and it didn't go so well? You know, they almost kicked you in the shin to get rid of you. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want anything to do with it. They basically said, if you're going to talk to me about this, don't talk to me at all. And you walk away saying, what did I do, God? How did I mess that up? It's not you. At that point in time, God's power wasn't at work in their heart. They weren't allowing any of the Spirit's conviction. They didn't want the conviction. There's nothing you could do. You are waiting on the power of God to maybe take those few words maybe a month, maybe a week later, maybe months or years later, and convict their heart by his power to do something. It wasn't that you didn't do it right or that you didn't do it well. It's all in the timing of God's power to convict and bring somebody to a saving relationship. And when it all comes together, 3,000 of them believe. When it comes together the week after, there's daily those being added. But it's God's power Without it, you can have all the disciples in the world, but many of them will not be true ones because it needs the power of God. 
God, help us to see he does things that we can't do. He brings people to himself. Father, we pray that you might minister to us, being reminded that the thing you did on the cross, dying there for our sin, was the very thing that people need. And there are people who contemplate it. There's people who heard about it again during the Christmas season, had put it aside and put it behind them and not given it too much thought. And yet we would pray that the power that you have might take and remind people of what they might have heard and just burden them, convict them, bring them like you brought these people to their spiritual senses, understanding they have a real problem and the only solution is Jesus. We thank you for what you're going to do for those around us who need Christ, that your power will be through our words, through our witness, our testimony. And we pray that some, in due time, in your way, in your place, might indeed stand beside 3,000 on that day who say, I trusted the Lord. And now as we think of communion and take communion together, may we be reminded that the reason we can say we're forgiven is because of what Jesus did. It's nothing we did, it's all what he did. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 185 in your hymnal before the communion, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Number 185. Let's sing together. You can remain seated. 185. <laughs> come to communion it is a reminder of what Jesus did for us it's a reminder that though it's 2,000 years ago which is by earthly terms a pretty long time it is still as potent and as wonderful and as real to our lives today as it was to those on that day in the book of Acts where they by 3,000 believed and we are to not lose sight of what Jesus did and that's the whole point of communion to not lose sight of what Jesus did. It's easy to forget. It's easy to put aside things that aren't right in front of us. And so today, right in front of us, in the form of a little piece of bread and a little cup with juice, is a reminder of what Jesus did. It brings back into focus what Jesus did for us. The older we get, and I include myself in that, the more it is to easily put aside you know, what Jesus did. And we need to be brought back. We need to be brought face to face again with what Jesus did on my behalf when he died for me. He understands that. He tells us to partake in a worthy manner. He talks in the passage I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians 11 that he who drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We ought to examine ourselves before we partake, that there is no sin that we haven't brought to him to have that 
forgiveness and that cleansing applied to our life, as he willingly does when we come sincerely to ask and confess our sin. But having confessed our sin and having brought before him the things that might stand between us and him that we might have done even this day, we come to this table and we then think back. How can he forgive those sins that I might have done even this day and those things I have done previous to this day and the things I will do from this day going forward? How can he forgive those? Well, it's because of what he did on the cross. It says in that same night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We look face to face at a piece of bread, and we're reminded of a body that was broken. We come face to face with a cup of juice, and we're reminded that his blood was shed. And we're reminded again that he did that out of love for us, for you, and for me. And so that's why we partake of this. And there's no better way to start a, a new year, though we're a, almost a week into it already, hard to believe, but to be reminded that that's what he has done for me. I'm going to ask one of our deacons to give thanks for the bread, the symbol of his body that was broken. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you were willing to send your son uh, down to live a perfect life and to die on the cross uh, for payment of, for our sins. And as we read in Acts and hear of the thousands that have repented of their sins and uh, accepted Jesus as their Savior, we're thankful to know that you're doing the same today, that we would renew ourselves uh, in him and also look to share that message with the world around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. of bread is a reminder of what Jesus did for you and me, a reminder of his body that was broken. Do this in remembrance of him.
And likewise, after supper, when they shared the cup, he reminded them that he was the next day going to shed his blood. And now for us, years later, he has shed his blood. This cup is a reminder of what he did for us. We ask one of our deacons to give thanks for the cup, the reminder of his bloodshed. Dear Heavenly Father, today as we take this cup of juice that represents your spilled blood on the splintered cross, we realize that you are the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, our past sins, present and future sins. Thank you for the gift of life that you've given us through your death on the cross. Today we, uh, we celebrate and we remember that ultimate gift of life through the power of your blood. Amen. This cup is a reminder that Jesus shed his blood for us out of love and compassion. This we do in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you that we can remind ourselves this day around the cup and the bread of what you did for us 2,000 years ago that today we have a wonderful forgiveness, a slate that is wiped clean because of what you did. And we thank you that your power was in that death, your power was in that resurrection, and your power is in the forgiveness of sin for those who have called upon Jesus, and we thank you. We pray that you'll bless the Deaconess Fund offering as we take that at this time. May you use it to help those in need, and may you bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
number 521, Redeemed. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. So thankful that he redeemed us by the price he paid on the cross, redeemed by the blood of our Lamb. 521. we thank you so much for the redemption, the salvation, the forgiveness that's in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much that there was a point in time that you called out to our hearts, that our hearts were uh, under conviction, and we chose to submit to that conviction. We didn't resist. We didn't harden our hearts against it. We chose to submit, and you revealed to our hearts the joy and the wonder of what Jesus did for us in his love and compassion, and we thank you for that. And while we followed you, some of us perhaps for many years, perhaps it's been ups and downs and, and difficult at times and easier at others, we know this, that you've been with us in every step of that path, every, every step of that journey, you've been beside us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. If there's anybody here today going through one of those harder, rougher patches of life, we know that you're with them in the midst of it. For just as you were faithful to empower salvation to come upon us when we believed, so you're there to help us. And we thank you for all your blessings. Help us to travel safely to our homes this day. May you just continue to give to us the joy and peace of our Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.